So this is an inside look at the tools and apps. Um, we're both in support, so we're going to be looking at this from kind of our lens rather than dev. Um, so just bear that in mind, and if you need us to clarify anything, because some of it we're looking at it from as if we're the end user kind of thing, so uh, it might be a little different. So that is us. I am a Craig. That is a Brendan. <laughs> and together we are, and you may wonder actually, we are the support right now, so any support tickets coming in aren't being answered because we're here. So we'll, uh, we'll have those to catch up with later on. So that, that's our first little troubleshooting tips, which is, I mean, you're probably all pretty familiar with this. Um, you know, the first thing you might assume is, oh, it's something with the app. But because Spiceworks kind of ties into other stuff, it's worth kind of figuring that out first. Uh, you know, the is the email account it's using, did that get locked out? Is the password wrong? Did it expire? Um, have you got a firewall? You recently changed something, and now Spiceworks can't do what it used to do. Um, did you just deploy a, a Windows Server update? Um, the one we found recently quite a bit is that uh, you'll put in a, a bunch of Windows Server updates, and then IIS gets turned back on. Um, so we'll see that in one of the case studies later, because IIS taking ports 80 and 443, if that's what the app was using, it comes back up, and the app can't take those ports. So then it sits there, it looks like the app isn't starting up. And if you're not kind of thinking in your head, what else could it be, you sort of assume that, oh, it's, it's Spiceworks, it's the database, it's a huge ticket, something like that. So the first thing that we sort of recommend in our guides now is the uh, the safe mode, which is, it's not really like the Windows safe mode. Um, it's more kind of a, get out of jail isn't the right analogy, but it, it goes into the app and turns everything off. Um, what we find when people raise tickets is, I've got a problem with the app, I want to troubleshoot it, but I can't get into it to turn anything off. So how do I do that? Um, what this will do is actually go into the back end, into the config files, and it'll turn everything off. Uh, we should get a little animation of that now. If you just run it as an admin, this is basically kill everything. So we're going to be doing no email, no remote collectors, no agents, no scanning, uh, cloud scans. Everything will be off. This is loading the Ruby interpreter. That's what the delay is for. And it runs, it takes like a second because it's it's just making a bunch of text changes. You know, ones are becoming zeros. Um, we'll see that it makes a little log file uh, just so you can kind of see what, what has happened. And those record does not exist. In the initial state, your database may not have an entry for something like... Uh, like the cloud scanning, say. Uh, and if that entry's not there, it means it's on. So what we do here is we enter a value for Google Apps Scan, uh, Office 365 Scan, and then we turn it off. And what you'll see at the bottom of this is a bunch of true values all the way across the bottom. And as it says there, true means turned off. So we've just gone through, smashed everything. So if it was related to scanning or plugins or tickets or email or the old mobile device management, all of that's now off. So when you next try to start the app, uh, we'll go past it. When you next try to start the app, none of that's going to happen. So as long as we can get the web server up, you can now get in and think, well, okay, I'm pretty sure it's not email. Let's turn email back on. Um, and when you do that, if that's still working, then maybe you want to turn scanning back on. I thought this was going to demo that for me. We'll wait for this to loop. Now, this is my selective one. So, so that would be your troubleshooting process. You've turned everything off. You've got to a good state, and you've gradually turned it back on. What this one is showing is you can actually put flags onto that safe mode command um, and tell it, you know, if you're, uh, you see that, minus A-C-E-M-R-D, which we'll see later what those stand for. Um, but those are things to leave on. So if you know it's not email, but it's probably scanning, you could leave a minus E there, and the email will be left on. So, okay, tickets can still come in and out. That's all good, but I've nixed the scanning, the plugins, and all the other good stuff. And then we'll move on to something a little bit more serious. So 
if you're if you happen to read the logs because you sleepless nights that kind of thing you may see something like that in there if that's happened then the safe mode's not really going to help you because we've got some problem with the database that malformed makes it sound like everything's gone this is terrible we're going to have to start over let's just you know find somebody to blame what you'll notice as you look into this though is it might be something as simple as we've got a record that should have a date and time stamp and it's empty for some reason or there's a ticket that's in a weird state that it can't be in, like it doesn't have a status of open, closed, or waiting. So it could be a real simple basic issue, but all we get in the logs is uh, database image is malformed. Um, this is kind of an example. When you've got, uh, if you have, not that anyone does, if you have something else that might be looking at your database while Spiceworks is running, it can have the effect of, uh, it will kind of spray data into the wrong tables. Um, so what you can see here, when we're looking at it in a database editor, it, it makes it look like a spreadsheet, which is awesome, because we can see very obviously here that those few uh, those few records, they're actually from the configuration table, uh, and they're in the, it looks like the devices table. So we know that's bad. When the app comes to read those, it's going to choke. It's, oh, my dates aren't there. There's weird stuff that's not supposed to be. Things that are numeric are now strings. So it's hate and life. Um, so, but essentially, all we need to do to fix that, we haven't lost any data. We just need to cut those out. Um, so, Craig, if I'm in a situation and it's you know 11 p.m., maybe you guys are not available at the time. I've I've emailed, but I've waited the five minutes and I'm sweating. Can I? How safe is safe mode to use? Like, am I gonna? Is it gonna maybe destroy some data? Is it gonna maybe like prevent me? Am I gonna be in a worse state, or is it? almost always safe to use. I'm glad you asked. Safe mode <laughs> Safe mode is very safe. And the reason it's very safe is because my paranoia of screwing this up a few times is it makes a backup first. So as soon as you see it launch, it makes a backup and then it does its thing. So if something weird did happen or it doesn't make it any better, you can just roll back to that backup and it's like you never ran it. Um, and that's a very good point because taking that further, we now have a, a repair script that we call Lifeboat, uh, and it does a very similar thing. And with this, we should see it running. Now, this will do a bunch of repairs that, that we know we can do safely on the database. It's kind of light touch. So if it notices uh, places where there needs to be a date, it'll just stick a date in there. If it notices a, a user that should be assigned to a ticket and they're missing, it'll just stick the admin user in there. Um, so it can fix a bunch of stuff. You see it happen very quickly there because it's on a test database. Um, but it will it'll dump recreate the database, which that solves a lot of problems. If there's a really if there's a record that shouldn't be in there, it won't get imported in when it dump recreates because it'll say, oh, there's an integer here, it should be a string, or you know, vice versa, and it'll get rid of those. So a lot of cleanup this is going to do for you. And you can see as we scroll down, we check a bunch of stuff. Mainly, we're going off of these date values because most things have a date stamp. If that's not there, we know that chances are that record may not be valid. It may not be supposed to be in that table. So as we get down to the bottom of this, we also remake the counts. Because we've recreated that database, we've got to figure out the ticket count again, device count, all that good stuff. It does that for you. Uh, then it'll actually vacuum the database. That can, I mean, you see it didn't take much space there, but if you've got a database that's several years old and you've been deleting and adding devices, tickets, plugins, and uh, so on and so forth, that may it may make like a 500 megabyte database. When you run this, it may end up as like 100 meg because that's all the real data is in there. The rest was just empty space. And that kind of doesn't help us from a, uh, a performance standpoint. So what if I was in one of these last sessions and I raised my hand and I said, hey, I have 50,000 tickets in my desktop app install. Uh, could I just, if I wasn't having like really bad problems, it's just like normal bad problems that I usually experience every day where it's getting slower and slower, could I run the repair tool just just to see if it helps improve performance for me? You could. There's uh, the ticket delete tool that we're going to look at. Maybe the better option, though. Um, you have more tools. Oh, yes. We got, we got everything. We got all the tools. 
And this is, you may wonder why these came about, and it's because we got so many tickets in and it became kind of formulaic. We knew that we've got to delete these bunch of tickets. But trying to help you guys through that, you know, without having you edit the database and risk something else going wrong was kind of tough. So we started to build these so at least, you know, you could resolve these issues yourself uh, for the most part or at least get started with it. And then we're just mopping up a little bit afterwards and you, you're back in a good working state. Um, maybe you don't even need to contact us. We'll just... Uh... Okay, so this is that example of the, the user records. If uh, if a user's corrupt or missing, we'll actually try to fix it. And that's what the uh, the lifeboat did there. And then another example of... Uh, so this is going back to that, uh, that config table that I showed you before that was inside the uh, devices. This is what Lifeboat will, will see, and it's not it's not 100 percent sure, so it's not going to delete those values. So what we will do when you tell us, hey, this is the results, we'll write a little script to kind of go in and just surgically remove those few values. Uh, now to Ben's point, what if it's related to tickets, and it might be a, a corrupt ticket? Maybe you've used a plugin that tried to close tickets, it didn't put the date and time stamp, and everything freaks out. Uh, or it could be an email loop, um, and the party piece with that is the app will often stay up for a surprisingly long time and get all of these uh, comments in, and it does what it knows to do, which is to respond to every comment that comes in. So that then causes more, <laughs> more bad emails coming back, um, and eventually the app will fall over. And usually with the size of email servers now, or cloud email servers, the app's going to die before the email server. So what happens then is you'll see, if you can start the app at all, it may never load the tickets view. You're like, yeah, that's, that's probably one or more bad tickets. Um, and you might look through the logs and you see like every mail check, it's the same ticket over and over and over again. So then you know, all right, ticket 12777 is the, is the bad guy. Uh, what we previously might have had to do was actually have you send the database to us and we'd edit it, uh, which obviously sucks just from the, the time and the, the privacy and security side of things. So now we have this guy. You'll have this. This will be in all of your installs. Um, and when you run it as an admin, you'll get this bunch of options. If it's just one ticket and you know what it is, you can just do that delete single ticket, put in the ticket number. Are you sure? Yes. Done. Um if it's a range of tickets, maybe it uh, for some reason they didn't all go onto the same ticket. You've got 50 or 500 tickets, all the same thing. They're all junk. You want to get rid of them. You can use the ticket range for that. If you're really not sure, it's safe to run this. It'll make a backup before it does anything. You can just do the find high comment tickets. Um, and we should see that on the next slide. Yeah, so what that'll do is it'll look for anything with over 150 comments, which... You might think, you know, if there's three, four, five hundred comments on a ticket, that's probably, it's either a super chatty user or something went wrong. So you look at this case, we've got 13,000 comments on there for one ticket. So that, that doesn't look right. That will cause major performance problems in the app. Um, so what we can do then after we've done that find high comment tickets is we can just kill it off. Or we can look at it with the remove comments for a single <coughs> ticket which is this guy. Um, normally what you'd see is maybe there'd be admins and techs and maybe the end user would be on there. But the real bad guy there is obviously the exchange server has sent back probably a, an NDR or some, some description and there's 13,000 of them. So we'll use our options then to remove that and that will allow you to keep the ticket. So the, the other one and two are kind of nuclear. They're going to get rid of the entire ticket. But if it was otherwise a good ticket and this thing just went sideways with NDRs, this will remove those and you can keep the ticket. So if there's good data in there or related devices, that kind of thing, this gives you the option to keep them. Uh, and there, there you can see it's actually running it. It looked for attachments, comments, got rid of all that rubbish and left you with an empty box, which in real world cases, you'd have the, the end user be in there, the admin and maybe text if, you know, a couple of people worked it. Okay, this one was, uh, I started to notice this on a few cases, so we, we added it in. You might get, like, no replies and mailer demons, 
it's junk you don't really want on your tickets, but you don't have to figure out every single ticket that it's on. It could be on thousands of tickets over a couple of years. Uh, so this option will basically just go through and remove all of those, and it's going to be delivery failure messages, user not found, you know, it's kind of rubbish that you don't want on your ticket. Uh, so you can basically run this guy, choose one and choose all of them, uh, and just clean that up. And again, overall, you're just minimizing the junk that's in your database, which gets you going longer before you end up with potential performance issues. Uh, Option six is the last one that uh, that I added. What we we put in the app, which is kind of cool, if you get a, uh, a delivery report saying that there's an issue with an end user, we'll stop trying to send notifications to it, which is good for stopping that problem, but we didn't put in a way to turn that back on. So this will actually do that for you. So if you've got a bunch of tickets and some users say, I'm, I'm not getting updates to these tickets anymore, you know, well, I'm replying, so it must be you. And then you check your mail transport logs, and the app really isn't sending stuff out. It might well be because of this. So the quick way to check is just run the delete tool, run option six. And if it tells you, like they're enabling 640 end users, there was a bunch turned off there, and it's turned them back on. It won't do bad stuff like postmaster or no reply addresses. It'll only look for actual end users. Um, so that may well be just, you know, a one-click fix. I'm going to hand over to Brendan for one of our case studies. Oh, with his own mic. Yeah. Hey there. Do you want Is, that on? Is that on? Yeah. yeah. Okay, just got to hold it up real close. I'm super good at public speaking. Uh, I've been on a week-long cajoling campaign to try and get Craig to do this, and he has steadfastly refused. <laughs> And then Ben, sensing my angst, uh, has arrived to provide some uh, moral support. Does anybody have any questions so far, actually, about anything that was presented? Like, I kind of feel like we can shake it up and let you guys have a moment if you have anything about all of that. Because then I can give the mic back to Craig. And, okay. <laughs> Come on, you guys. <laughs> uh, also, um, did, you bring that, did you pull that website up on here, Craig? No, okay. What is the URL to the... I wanted to talk about that URL. There's one... Okay, whatever. We'll get to that later. There's a, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about here is covered in detail in the community in a, in a variety of support and troubleshooting articles that kind of lay it out in a more clear way than than uh, this. But this will all be in the slides and you can look at it later. So, uh, Performance issues are a huge thing for us. We see them all the time. Uh, there's a, a lot of different reasons that they can happen. Um, and this is going to show using... Uh, regular expressions to try and suss out some of that stuff. Uh, we use Notepad++ almost exclusively, although I don't know if you've switched now that you're a Mac user. OK. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, and so in, the, in this instance here, you can see uh, at the bottom of that screen, there's a, a regular expression that's being used that looks like a bunch of nines and zeros. But what it is doing is looking for uh, long queries. And so in this instance, the search results return a bunch of things that are taking 110 seconds in some cases or more to complete. It's a mail check. That's obviously indicative of a problem. And so using Notepad++ and regular expressions as the in the search query can really help narrow the focus of your uh, um, searching. Uh, so... <clears throat> In, in the, I'm sorry, I'm already lost. Help. <laughs> sorry. The sweat is coming down my face. Um, so, yeah. So, so what if, what if I'm in a situation yes. where it seems like uh, all the emails, I, like maybe I've got an email uh, set up to go to the help desk and I have like a mirror set up so I know that emails are coming in but I'm not actually seeing tickets processed. Might might I be in a situation similar to what you're describing right now? Right, right. and so as I was reviewing the slides, thanks, Ben. Yeah. Uh, little angel wings on your back and everything. Uh, <laughs> um, who said that? Yeah, yeah. Just come right on up here in the front row and just stare at me <laughs> and make this work. <laughs> Um, so yeah, looking looking through looking through the logs again, um, the production log in, in the instance that he's talking about would help us figure out whether the mail check is just failing outright or if it's stuck on messages. Kind of going back to what Craig was talking about, you can see you can visualize ticket loops in there. So if you're looking for, uh, if you're searching the production log, for example, for the term mailman, 
uh, you'll find all of the app's attempts to collect mail and uh, within those search results you would then see that it's constantly trying to pull in one message but never succeeding or it sees 47 messages in the inbox and you're like that's probably not good either um, and allows you to sort of focus on that maybe use the ticket delete tool to get rid of something that shouldn't be there or turn off email for a second using safe mode and go investigate what's in the uh, help desk mailbox and pull out things like calendar invites and stuff that will cause the app to choke sometimes. Yes. Ben. And you, you might be in a situation like this um, every day or like once a month and you're like, oh, what, why does this keep happening on the 31st or something like that? So you could, you could use these kind of tools in your toolbox to go check out production log and look for yeah. When does this come up and you know what's what's actually happening behind the scenes in the app? And we can help you process through that stuff as well. So we've, you know, over the years had folks come in and like, yeah, I've been looking, I've been trying to find where this is and I've been trying to do as much research as I can on my own before I come contact you guys because whatever the reason is, you know, I'm, I'm interested, I want to learn how it works, that sort of thing. So these are, yeah. the idea here is to give you a little bit of a tool set, um, but not leave you entirely out to dry. You know, you can always uh, come to us for help, but yeah. I, I love tro your turn is over. I love <laughs> no, actually, you can take it away. Uh, mail flow issues are super, super fun to troubleshoot, actually. So don't hold those to yourselves. You can just create support tickets and I'll work them with you because I don't know why, but it's just fun. Um, so, uh, so let me see here. Yeah, we've already talked about comments and things like that. So this is sort of the link at the top, the community.spiceworks.com support. And I think it's slash index we'll give you a whole raft of troubleshooting articles uh, that we curated based on uh, tickets that we were getting. And I wish that URL was in here, so like, ask me at the end and I'll remind you about it. But community.spiceworks.com slash support slash index will give you all sorts of stuff, like way more than what we're talking about right now. Uh, some of it's in, in more detail. And again, it's all, it's all been created based on our experiences in support uh, troubleshooting else issues. Um, Application launch. This also is a troubleshooting article. This is what got me thinking about it last night when I was reviewing these and panicking. Um, <laughs> you did this to me. <laughs> uh, so this is another really common one that we get. Uh, you'll you'll make a change to the app. Maybe you move it to a new host or something like that. You fire it up and it just sticks on this screen forever, interminably. Uh, it is almost invariably because another application on the server has grabbed uh, one of the ports that the app is running on. So Netstat is your friend in this case. Uh, it can help either determine that that is the case or uh, help you figure out which app is doing it. Although I, I found in most cases what you'll end up seeing is something like this where it says can't obtain ownership information. So you end up kind of just going to the usual suspects like IIS or some other application that's been installed. Maybe it has some web services that run on the backside. Um, but Netstat will help kind of figure this out. So in this case, you know, if you were submitting your logs to us and saying the app won't start, we saw this, we'd be like, change the ports or find the offending application that's causing the issue there. This is what a normal running app would look like, uh, where you can see the uh, processes associated with the ports. And I think this kind of thing can happen like you've just installed the app for the first time or you're a five-year, ten-year veteran or something like that. And you're well, suddenly I can't get to it. Well, it could be a new application that you've thrown on the same server and this sort of situation. Weird like. stuff does it too. Like I remember for a while Skype, like people were installing Skype on their hosts and Skype would bind to port 80. I don't remember why, but it was screwing things up for Spiceworks for a little while. I don't see those so much anymore. But it can be it can be weird suspects that you're not anticipating. Um, here's another example that you see sometimes where people uh, will inadvertently and arguably because the app allows it which it shouldn't uh, create the same port number for HTTP and HTTPS, which won't work. Uh, those have to be different. So again, this is stuff that would show up in the logs, um, possibly also in Netstat as well. So here's an example of it working properly. Uh, and here's, here's a way you can change the ports. Yeah, so going off of the system tray icon, you can pull up the preferences and edit the ports there and also, as you can see, uh, change it to run as a service. This is your part, right? No, okay. <laughs> no, I love you guys. Um, 
So the cloud help desk is, is actually pretty fun also because a lot of the stuff that gives us trouble in the on-premises help desk has sort of been sorted out in the cloud. And so it, it is pretty easy to, to work with. Uh, there are some things that we have to do on the back end, though, like getting rid of organizations or doing bulk deletion of tickets. Um, email issues tend to be an issue uh, or it can be hard to, to sort out. Did you make this slide, Ben? That looks like one of mine. Yeah. It, sure, it sure does. Lots of boxes. So, uh, yeah. Ben was our manager also for a while, and every meeting included whiteboard uh, discussions with circles and boxes, and it became kind of a joke. So here's here's some classic Ben right here for the archives. Um, so in the, in the cloud help desk, obviously, you can have multiple organizations. There can be many more than two. Uh, and end users can exist between organizations. Admins can manage or will manage both of the organizations. So there's not really a distinction in terms of admins and techs as to what organizations they can work. Uh, so this is kind of just visually displaying how that can exist. Uh, so with adding and removing users, there's obviously some issues here that can crop up. Like we were talking about earlier, or maybe I was thinking about it earlier, uh, if you you know invite a user, for example, before their mailbox has been provisioned, and we try and send them something, then we're going to stop sending mail to that user. Uh, that causes issues with invites because people will spin up the help desk, add all their admins, thinking that that's what they should do because it's reasonable. Um, those generate NDRs on our end. We're like, we're not going to send to those people anymore. And then you guys submit a ticket and say, none of my admins got their invite. So uh, that's one thing to look for to be sure. Uh, this is another one um, that probably some of you have already seen. You maybe, when you found out about the Cloud Help Desk, went and registered an account, poked around in it, thought this is cool. Later, your boss or somebody else invites you or wants to invite you to join your their help desk. But because you already have an account, it won't let you join that one. So this is another instance where you kind of need to contact us so we can remove the other account for you if you don't have access to it anymore or, uh, um, yeah, or if you can do it yourself. I mean, if you still have access to that, you can you can close that account or have somebody remove you from their account. Um, and so, sort of much of the same. This is this is actually a representation of a bug that exists, but if you are, are super super aggressive with your mouse clicking, uh, you can inadvertently add two or three texts when you're uh, putting a user in and it kind of is invisible. You wouldn't see it necessarily until you're trying to do something with that user later and then you, you don't have the option to. And it's because there's duplicates. That's a support ticket also right now until uh, that team sorts that out. Ben's on that team, so you can talk to him later about that. <laughs> <clears throat> Are we still not at you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys are super great. I love you. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah, the Active Directory stuff is a little bit tricky also. So the Cloud Help Desk does allow for AD integration. It doesn't import users like the desktop app does, but it will uh, allow them to authenticate against the user portal using their AD uh, credentials. This does not work for admins. Admins still have to have their own account. Um, so. That's kind of the same as the desktop app in that regard. But setting it up is a little tricky. You have to have an IIS server to install an application on, and then a user's sign-in request will be proxied over to the IIS server, which will query against your locally installed AD. This all happens within your LAN. Uh, it's not happening over the internet or anything like that. And then once it's authenticated, then it allows them to uh, view the portal. So. Uh, during during the setup process, this is an issue. Like entering the credentials incorrectly can be a problem with that. Um, there are log files. We can help you look at the log files if you run into issues with <laughs> getting <laughs> getting this up and running. Yes, I was ben. just going to say um, if you're interested in help desk server, uh, the oh, same right. functionality is available there. And yeah. so um, you know you may have these same types of issues. Uh, the the layout's a little bit different, right? Because if you're running help desk server, maybe that's on the same network with your Active Directory server and with all of your end users and that sort of thing. But um, functionally, kind of the same thing. So the things Brendan's describing in terms of issues that might come up may apply to you if you're if you're thinking I might move from desktop server over, over to um, help desk server. And I apologize if I'm blowing through this again. I'll stop if you guys have if somebody wants to raise their hand and ask me to clarify anything I've shot past already. Then feel free. Okay. Um, uh, there are some error messages that make sense. Some of these are a little cryptic sometimes, but this was a good one where it kind of helps us figure out that uh, the credentials are incorrect in this case. So um, the 
the configuration file is stored. So there are some times when you want to go back in there and edit. You can edit the password in this example. There's also some lookup type information about where your users reside that you might have to edit at some point if things change in your Active Directory uh, setup. Um, so the key, yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> reading the slide with you. Um, so having the auth server address, uh, you can also check that directly. So if you're trying to log on to the portal and it's not working, you can just put that URL in and see what you get. That might generate error messages as well without having to like impersonate an end user as you go. Reporting. Okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> okay. I'll try to be fairly quick with this because Ben has something exciting to show, oh, yeah. I think, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So this is primarily looking at the, uh, the original Spiceworks app um, because we're going to be looking at SQL. Um, it doesn't really apply to the Cloud Help Desk because you can't see the database in that way. Uh, but it will likely apply to Help Desk Server because that's running Postgres SQL. Um, so really, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be potentially looking into that to run, you know, more complex queries. The reporting on the Cloud Help Desk is it'll just literally dump a CSV of a bunch of fields, and there's not really much you can do with it. With Help Desk Server, though, because you can look at the back-end database, if the data is in there, you can get at it and do whatever you want. You know, if you want to make a, a very customized report, um, that's available to you. Um, for now, we're going to go over just the uh, the regular desktop app itself, which it's a little more friendly uh, just because it's got a UI for it. So maybe if you want to practice and just play around with it, this would be a, a good way to do it. Um, so what can we get out of it? With the original desktop app, you've got devices, mobile devices, software, tickets. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there, purchases. Um, you'll get some of that in the help desk server, um, obviously not devices or anything yet. So who can do that? It, it's pretty much everybody um, that is like a, a tech or admin level. The reporting user is kind of a good one if you've got somebody who's not really IT but they need to get reports. It saves you having to do it because they can log in and they can get reports. They can't do anything else, they can't edit, they've got no admin functions, but they can get at those reports, run them on demand, um, and you're all good. Uh, so really, we're just trying to remove some of the load off of you guys there because you don't want the pointy-haired boss coming every month and saying, oh, I need you to run this report. No, do it yourself. You're a reporting user. You don't say it like that, obviously. Uh, Pepper rolls and advanced report author uh, authorization will allow you to get a little more granular, granular than the app allows. Um, so that you could get very, you know, if it's a... Uh, I don't know, somebody from a different department, you only want them to see one report when they log in. You can actually do that with those plugins. So they can't even, they can't get it wrong. There's one report, and that's the one you run. So uh, that may help you out also. Um, with the app having scheduled reporting, you may not even need to give other people access. You can just say, once a week or once a month, the app's going to email you automatically with this report. So if you, the IT pro, are on vacation, this stuff is still going to happen. You don't get a stupid phone call for, I didn't get the report. It was emailed. Again, you'd be nicer about it because you're all nice like that. Okay, so the SQL, um, why would we even bother learning that? It, it's in everything. Database side, it's a, a very well-known, well-used language. So it's worth knowing at least a little bit of it um, because you can dig down into a ton of data that generally you might not be able to see, and it may not be surfaced how you would want it to be in the app. Um, but with SQL, if you can write the query and you can figure it out, you can get like way down in the weeds. So if we look at it in a, uh, a database editor, it kind of makes it easier. You could do it on the command line, but then you have to kind of already know what's in the tables. Uh, this way, if you're using a database editor, a free one or a paid one, you'll actually see like a spreadsheet view like that of the table. So then, you know, I need stuff out of the tickets table, which is what this is an example of. But I don't really know what's in there. After you look at it, you can see, okay, I want the summary, I want the description, I want the status, and I want the ID, which is the ticket number. So by viewing it, you can already sort of build up what you think you're going to need to get. Uh, in Spiceworks DB, Spiceworks underscore prod DB, that's the entire database. Because it's SQLite, it's just a flat file. 
Um, did I skip one? No. So by editing that file, you're going to use a backup, obviously. You're not going to do it with a running instance. That is what you will effectively be working with. This schema is available on the community, and there is a link coming up later on. So you can kind of see how tables relate to each other. Um, the tickets one gets a little bit interesting because you've got a work uh, table, which is where admins have booked their time. Then you've got the tickets table itself. Then you've got the comments, which are all of the replies on tickets. So you might potentially be playing with three tables to get stuff out of the uh, out of the tickets area of the app. We were going to look at database, but I don't think we've got the time. So I'm going to skip that. Uh, it was essentially just showing you more of the spreadsheet views. Um, so what we are going to look at is a basic SQL statement. This, uh, the way I kind of start these, when I've got no idea what's in the table, is I'll just do select star from, and that will just say, give me everything. Um, you might want to be a little bit careful and maybe put limit on it, which we'll see in a sec, because if it's a million rows, you don't want every time you try and test something out for it to have to pull a million rows out of the database, especially if... It's not Spiceworks because you're not doing it on the live database, but if it is a live database and you're doing this, you don't want to tie this up for other users. Um, so that's got the uh, the select is what do I want? From is which table is in there? Um, is it in? And where is how am I going to filter it? So if you just want the open tickets, status is not closed. It's kind of English for the most part, although some of the the way that it's constructed is a little odd. Um, some conditional examples like greater than, less than. This is how, again, you you don't want the entire tickets table. You want to start to narrow it down. You can do this by dates, by times, by its status, by who reported it, by who worked on it. Um, or you can start using wildcards, which uh, you might want. I mean, we kind of use this a lot. If we've got a ticket that sounds familiar from a user, and it mentions something like LDAP or a particular product, we might do that kind of a, a light query to see what other tickets that message, uh, that text is in. Uh, I don't want to steal your thunder because I mean, maybe it's just right after this, but you could you could like write a query like this, spend the time, come up with something very specific, right? And then you could, instead of having to do this using a database backup and, a, and an editor and stuff like that, you could pull that into the reporting section, right? With, right within the app, right? Yes, and I don't think there's screenshots in here. But uh, the, the reporting engine within the app, has, as I mentioned, that UI will actually just allow you to create a new report, click the SQL button, and you can write the SQL directly in there and, and build the, uh, the report that way. So like a reporting user would have access to that after you had written that, so they, they don't have to know any of these complex things. They just, oh, yeah. there's a new report available. I can run that SQL report now. Exactly. So we're, we're making things easier for the other users because because we're nice people. So the normalization, this is great for the database. It gets rid of the redundancy. Like You'll see there the created by. Let's do this, uh, this guy, because he's my favorite, that little guy. So you might see that. You look at the tickets table. Yeah, I'm just going to pull these four columns out of the tickets table, and that's all I need. And then you see created by is just a number. And like, well, who the hell's that? So the normalization is great for the database. Uh, for performance, efficiency, for the query optimization. But it's not great for you because now you've got to deal with a join. So what we would get if we just pulled the stuff out of the database, out of that one table, is we get something like this. We'd have the ticket number, the summary, and what number created it. Uh, great. So now we extend that a little bit. This is where the join comes in. And what we're saying is join this table to this table. And SQL doesn't know on what column, so you have to tell it. Uh, so you can see those bits in red, what's changed now. Now we have to declare that it's the ID from tickets, it's the summary from tickets, it's the email from users. So that's our second table coming in. And we're saying we want to join the user on the ID and the created by. What we'll end up with there is then we've actually got what we had before, but now we've got the email address. So that's a little more useful. Or we could go off of the the first and last name, or their address, or their department. Uh, you'll see the limit eight on there, because I didn't want the whole database. I just wanted the first eight records, and that just made sure that my query was correct before I you know, put that in a production, if you will. Uh, 
So we might want to alias that because saying tickets dot summary users dot email tickets dot created that that kind of gets boring. And I got bored just saying it. So what you can do is use aliases where we see from tickets t. Now everywhere you would have had to write tickets, you can just write t. So it's t dot summary users u u dot email. So that makes things a little bit more readable. And I would. I would tend to try and standardize on this for yourself because when you start reusing old bits of SQL later on, if you've kept this as like my system tickets is always T, users is always U, you can just copy and paste bits out of your SQL to build another more complex query later on and you'll know I can just run it, it's going to work. So then the, the other thing is obviously tickets.summary is what's going to be that, that column header in the resulting report. The pointy haired boss may not know what that is your end user might get a bit scared by it. So if it needs to be called a ticket synergy opportunity, you can do that. If the email has to be a treasured user because that's the corporate policy, you can do that as well. And the good thing about this is you've created that SQL, you've prepared all of this in advance, so it's not like that report gets run and then somebody has to do something in a spreadsheet to make it usable. This is just, it's done, it's in there, it's always in the SQL. Even if I have to just get my tech to run this because I'm not in the office, it doesn't matter. We'll go into uh, ordering real quick. This might be, you know, you need the oldest first or the newest first. You'll get all of these slides, so I'm, I'm not going to go into this too much because I don't want us to miss out on Ben's bit. More ordering. Aggregate functions. This bit's kind of interesting, like how many tickets? Use count star and you can kind of ask the database and then you may want to extend it. Well, count the tickets that are still open. There's 71. You could have that as you, if you've got some kind of billboard graphs, you've got a uh, TV screen in, in the ops area or something. Uh, that messy, horrible looking thing at the bottom, we would, uh, we might want to take an average disk size, but we're storing them uh, in bytes. So you'll see that huge long number at the bottom. That's not very readable. So then we convert the size, which is that 1024 by 1024 by 1024. That gets us to that second bit. Uh, it's still kind of unfriendly because it's not two decimal places, um, which we're more happy with. So that rounding will get us to that. So now it's 102.11 gigabytes. Um, again, we can group. That will allow us to figure out, well, how many hardware tickets have I got? Or if those categories are more granular, it could be, you know, related to this switch or this building or, you know, whatever you want. You can actually group it to then go, you know, if you need to get more budget, maybe this is the kind of thing where you're starting to put some data around it to uh, to justify what you're asking for. The limit we already talked about. If you were, uh, if you just want to limit it to the first three in that case. Um, you can restrict what data you're actually getting back, so you're not doing a million queries. I don't even want to do this next join slide. It looks horrible. But. So custom reports there. This is something you could have prepared, uh, and once it's in there and prepared and it's perfect, it's how you like it, you can run that every month, every week. It can go into a, a Power BI system, for example, or uh, it could just be shown on a in somebody's email, maybe, a boss, a middle manager, whatever. Uh, or you could have it up on a screen in your ops area. That is join menagerie, which we will not even go into. But if you if you get into joins, SQLite can do the top two, the inner and the left outer join. It can't do the bottom two, but the full Postgres can. Uh, so help desk server may allow you to do that. Uh, an example, if if you wanted to join two tables, it might be I want everything from the users table and I want to know all the devices they have. So that might be why you'd want to uh, join two tables together. There's a few little links there. I think we hopefully we've just got enough time to get Ben on there. Yeah, let's do it. It'll take me just a sec to set up. Probably a newer laptop than mine, probably fancier. It's got more stickers.
So for the reporting help, do you have step-by-step? Because I've tried doing some reports and I'm obviously doing something wrong because they're not coming out like I want them. Do you have some that show exactly what you're supposed to include in order to get certain data in there? There is some stuff in the community. The Extending Spiceworks group is good for that. Um, with these slides, that might help uh, point you in the right direction. And the, the other thing I do is look at the, uh, there's a shared reports section on the community. And it's a bunch of, there's a lot of SQL reports in there. If I can find something similar, I'll steal it uh, and then just put my bits in there that it, it'll kind of help you get where, you know, like, well, how did they get the devices from there? Oh, they've joined it on XYZ. So that kind of helps. And it's specific to Spiceworks, which is kind of cool. And those reports are all shared free too. So you can just pull those and take bits out of it. But otherwise, definitely submit a support ticket and just say, you know, I want... I need tickets older than this month that aren't closed that were by this user and how the heck do I craft that SQL string? And we can kind of guide you through it then. Sure. Cool. Any other questions on desktop reporting? Yeah. back in 2016, said it was actually presented in a newer version, and it's related to paused or tickets that are on hold. Is that something that's still being developed, or is it going to be, or is it in Help Desk Cloud? Because um, I cannot remove tickets that are paused from counting down days that they're open for users still. And that's like the biggest issue that we have is tickets that are maybe not being worked on are still adding days being opened, and that's screwing up our reports big time. I don't know the answer to that. I was, I was thinking about the extending Spiceworks group earlier when you mentioned it because uh, there are people out there that are absolute gurus of writing SQL queries. And so yeah. I don't know what group you got. Yeah. I've looked on the forums quite a bit. And Were you in the ex extending Spiceworks group by chance? I don't think so. Okay. I, I, I do refer people out there because it's hard for us sometimes to, to, like, we'll get people who are asking us to write really substantial SQL queries for them, which either have already been duplicated in the yeah. community in the shared reporting section or, and we have varying levels of SQL skills on, on our team. You know, like some of us are better than others. Uh, I am not that guy. <laughs> so uh, I can do the, I can do some like basic stuff and figure things out. But once yeah. it's like, I need to know this and this and this, and like when the ticket was started, but when it was paused and all this kind of stuff, the, I have watched this happen. Like I've referred people to extending Spiceworks and then kind of kept an eye on it. They'll post a question. Somebody goes back in 24 hours with some giant, you know, query and says, "Try this," and it works. Mm. So, okay, I wouldn't shy away from that group. And at that all. was in the previous slide that that group that was there? the extending Spiceworks okay. group was in one of the previous okay. slides. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, but if it doesn't work, though, you know, don't. I mean, don't just drop off. Like if you ask us for help and we refer you to a group and you're like, "I was asking them for help and it doesn't work out there," come back because we'll put our heads together and okay. figure it out. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, right here, yeah. Actually, because you have um, devices on the screen right now, we run a number of reports on devices, and we have a whole lot of... Um, like, we've added a lot of custom fields to our devices. Is there a limit on that before it affects the performance? On the reporting? A limit on the number of uh, custom like fields. attributes, custom attributes yeah. you have. I don't think we ever found a limit. I don't know if you guys have. No. I mean, you, like, what's the what's order of magnitude? Like 10, 100? What do you have right now? We have to keep all of the computers in the archive that have been destroyed. Um, so there's, like, upwards of 600 devices, and they all have at least 10 custom fields on each one. So the way those get added, um, when you add a custom attribute for a device, you're actually setting it. It's sort of a global thing, so it applies to all devices. And so it's not um, it's not creating a lot of extra work for the application if you have some devices that have them set, some devices that don't have them set. It's sort of the same the same amount of work um, from the perspective of storing that information and, and then recalling it later in the application. So, so yeah, like I said, I don't think we've seen an upper limit in the past, um, but. 
should be okay. So if, if you do have issues, you can always contact us. Okay, so uh, I don't know how many, have you, maybe you've already seen this actually. How many of you have already seen me talk about a little bit of this? Okay, some of you, maybe half of you. Um, so I'll go through uh, those that have already seen it. I don't know which session you saw it in. I showed it a little bit in, the, in one session and a little bit more in another one. I'll go through a little bit of it and then we'll try to um, maybe get some questions uh, out on the floor here. So, okay, so uh, what are we looking at here? So in the um, inventory online, which is the cloud version of inventory, and then the cloud help desk, and then also in help desk server, there's export functionality that's available. We've got it, um, we've been working on it pretty recently. We've got it down to the point where um, it's just kind of point and click. You can go click a button, click export, a file gets downloaded. You're not having to do a lot of complex things to get the data out. Once you've got that file in hand, you could feed it into something like Power BI. We don't have like a partnership with Microsoft or Power BI or something like that. Um, there's other tools that can do this reporting. We selected this because we went out and tried to get some feedback. What are you guys currently using? What's available? Uh, what's cost effective? In this case, Power BI is free. Uh, at least right now. Um, and so that's why we went with Power BI. So uh, what we did is we looked at Power BI and made effectively kind of like a template. If you think about other Microsoft products like I don't know, Word, PowerPoint, those sorts of things, uh, it's a template that allows you to dump in that data. So again, go back to your application, your help desk, or your, um, your inventory. You've extracted that export file. You can dump that into this template within Power BI, and it's going to populate all this information for you. Um, kind of on the fly. You could do that repeatedly. So we did that as, as a um, part of testing the process here. You could, a week goes by, something changed, or you think something changed, you could re-export, only takes a, a couple of minutes, pull that file out, and then dump it back into Power BI again, and then you'd have that refreshed information. And, um, you know, looking forward, we may be able to make tighter integrations. That's sort of future stuff that we may we may do later, kind of depending on what y'all's feedback is. Uh, so that's why I want to get to that um, and talk through that a little bit. Okay, so what is this one? So this is the inventory uh, template, the inventory dashboard. So I've extracted data from inventory, dumped it into Power BI, and then it's populated all these widgets on this page here. And so I'll, I'll start at the bottom and kind of quickly run through these. So um, these are things that you would be able to see in the inventory application, but maybe not aggregated. And so that's why having a reporting interface like this is, is powerful. So I can see devices that have a drive space issue maybe that's customizable. So maybe you don't care if it's less than 10. You want to know if it's less than 1. You can, you can, set a, uh, you can alter that filter, alter that widget to show you devices that have less than 1, less than 4, whatever it is. Uh, totally customizable. Same is true for the RAM there. Uh, maybe you want to identify devices that are a little bit older, that are on the network, you know. We thought we got all those laptops that we know had less than a certain amount of RAM, or you could do something like um, specific processes or something like that. You could set up, you can make alterations to this template. And that gives you a quick view to identify those devices uh, that you need to go, you know, rip out of someone's hands and say, hey, this thing's too old. I know everything on it is your baby. We're going to help you. We're going to get you moved over. You're going to have a new laptop. It's going to be okay. Uh, the same thing with the bottom right is a similar kind of filter. Um, that's for software, so that's pulling in not just the details of the hardware of the device, but also what's installed on each one of those devices. That comes out with that export, and that's dumped into this template. Um, so you could customize this. In this example, we used like older versions of Firefox and GoToMeeting. Maybe you're looking for um, software that's got security vulnerabilities on the network, and you want to uh, either rip off that software, update it, something like that. Uh, it gives you a quick method to do that. So. Those are um, those are kind of specific use cases. What's across the top here is is kind of more um, interactive and maybe illustrates better what you can do uh, with a reporting interface like Power BI if you dump the data in. So, if you look at the bottom left here, the model and age. This is a graph of um, all of the hardware that you have on the network that was pulled in with this export and uh, its current age. And you can you could define these um, these filter limits. So you could say maybe a five years not my cycle. I do a three year cycle for hardware. You can you can customize the filter to change it to three years, and then you'd have a quick view of which devices are in those ranges. And so, what's interesting is you not only have this graph, but you can quickly filter by just single click, and it'll limit what's shown in the table across the top here to just those pieces of hardware and just those pieces of hardware that are within that time frame. The same is true. So if we clear that filter, the same is true for this other widget. This is that same full list of devices and all of the different OSs that you've got. Um, across the network and you can click on any one of these and filter down so, so let's say we want to get rid of uh, devices that have 10.12 because that's an older version of mac os we want to 
either replace those or we want to make sure those guys get upgraded. Why haven't they already upgraded? You can quickly filter down and see um, just a list of those devices. So uh, this is, um, again, just a template that we've created for Power BI for use with y'all's data uh, from inventory online. Uh, this could be customized. You could make changes. So if we if we got this template file into y'all's hands, you can make changes to the template to customize it, like I said, not only changing just uh, little bits here and there of you know what software or what's the size limitation, stuff like that, but you can add additional um, widgets or additional pages, additional dashboard, dashboards to your um, to your Power BI um, interface. So that's inventory. Before I move to help desk and we can get a little bit more in depth. Uh, again, anybody have any questions on inventory stuff? Yeah. Oh, 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 five minutes. Okay. No, five minutes. All right. Anybody else? All right. So let's look at uh, let's look at help desk. For, so for those of you that saw this, um, this is the same interface. Um, this is the uh, an export from your help desk. So same kind of thing. A couple of clicks. You get a file. You dump it into Power BI. And we can see a little bit more of the power of um, what uh, uh, they've done here with the Power BI interface when we're using Help Desk. And so it's going to be a little hard because I'm going to have to like, use both hands here. But um, across the top on the left, you've got status, assignee, the, those tickets that have custom attributes set or unset, um, which, ta which tickets go to specific organizations. And then you can see that reflected over on the right as well. So you've got a breakdown. Uh, right here of tickets by quarter and which which are open and closed. You've got a uh, breakdown of tickets by organization, that sort of thing. So all of these are interactive. So you can use, you could click on just this organization and you can see that it's going to go back and forth and you're going to lose tickets that are in the Delta organization because I'm filtering down to just this infinite org, right? Um, and you can also kind of use these together. So say I want to find all this person's tickets and if I control click, I could say I want to see which ones are open. Oh, thanks, thanks. Which ones are open for this specific assignee? So let's do that again. Let me try Control Click. There we go. So now you can see uh, just that guy's tickets for just that time frame, or maybe you want to clear that, and I want to see all tickets closed by this specific person that are specific to that organization, that sort of thing. So a couple of clicks and you're able to quickly filter. So the idea, the goal here, thanks, Craig. The, the goal here was um, uh, many of you may have had to do, you know, the pointy head, the pointy headed boss comes to you and says, hey, I want to know, I got three questions. I need you to answer those. Well, it might take you uh, a couple hours messing around with Excel, getting all that information pulled out and uh, into a usable format. And by the time you get there, you're like, I've, I forgot the questions he asked me, or maybe they're questions you're asking yourself because you're trying to be a good employee. Like, how much time are we spending on this thing? And do we need to get rid of it? Um, sometimes half the work or more than half the work is just all the effort of uh, getting there with the report that you have uh, that you're that you're trying to get to and then you're like okay I'm gonna come back tomorrow now I'm gonna come back and, and figure out what we need to figure out now that I've got the report available and I've got the data extracted and I know it's accurate that sort of thing so the goal here with trying to get this into y'all's hands in, in Power BI is to provide a click a couple clicks you get it in there and now I can start asking questions I don't have to think about how does it work, or is it accurate, or those sorts of things? Um, we've taken care of that for you with the template. Uh, so you could, uh, you know, do these do these types of things. Drill down into this specific assignee that's on my team. Maybe it's his annual review. I want to see what he's been doing, which organizations he's been working for, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll show you one more thing. Since we have like two more minutes, maybe two more things. Let's let's try to do two more things. Okay, so. Let's go back to the full view here, get a little bit more detail. Some of you might have seen a little bit of this already. But um, so one of the things that we added to um, help desk specifically, and it's something that we could do with inventory as well in the future, um, is we uh, we created an additional kind of output form in the um, in the export file that you get. So whenever you go through that same process, we're going to do a little bit of work in the background when you click that export button to give you a file that's got a little bit of extra information in it. And one of those things is this all comments field. I don't know, can you guys see this? Is it like big enough? Yeah, you can see it there. Um, the all comments field is, is a concatenation of all comments for an, each individual ticket. And so the intention there was to effectively have a keyword search. And so that's what this fly out here is going to allow us to do. This, these are sort of advanced filters. Um, so I could come in here. And so for all filters on this page, I want to apply a filter that every widget is affected. So I want to see just those open and closed tickets that this filter applies to. I want to see just those assignees that this filter applies to, et cetera. So let's look at. I used this uh, example before, and this one worked pretty well. 
Let's apply a filter to that all comments column so that I can see only tickets that have any comment. Maybe there's 10 comments and one of them has what I'm looking for. That's the purpose of that all comments uh, field. Any comment on those tickets um, that has the, the word remote session in there, you can actually see a little bit of it there. Um, so we can apply that to the other filters on page as well. So this doesn't, when you use these um, filters on the right, it doesn't exclude your ability to do um, kind of click filters here on the left. So I can still, I can still filter down uh, using the kind of the one click filters out on the left um, to, to further eliminate uh, tickets that I don't want to see. So, if, you know, in this case, there's only four, but if you had a couple hundred, maybe you want to filter down a little bit more um, to kind of get what you wanted. So uh, there's one more thing. Okay, we're like right at time. Let me, let me see if we can do one more thing. Um, date filtering is a common request, I would think. Um, I know for in, in desktop, it definitely is. Um, you can do relative uh, date filtering or absolute date filtering. And so what that means is if I want to know in 2019 between April 14th and April 26th, I could get a filter of that using, using this flyout on the right. If I want to know a relative time period, so everything in the last 14 days, everything in the last 90 days, something like that, I can do that same kind of thing. So um, the uh, Power BI interface is, is very robust. And so th actually the challenge is not what it offers. It, it offers a ton of stuff, right? We haven't even gotten, we haven't scratched the surface here. The challenge is, is the complexity and sort of learning. And so that's the purpose of us providing these templates is so that you don't have to go in and become a Power BI expert before you can get any value out of those export files. So. Um, if you have questions about Power BI and like I want to try it out, that sort of thing, um, come talk to me or make sure you sign up for um, the session. Uh, uh, make, make sure you register with the session and we'll, we'll contact you for reviews about the session and we can get you um, the template files. So we can get you a link to, so you can download the, the template files and try it out on Power BI. And to get Power BI, you can just go, just go Google Microsoft Power BI. There's a download form. Um, I think they want you to sign up for an account, but there's no, you don't have to like type in your credit card information or anything like that. It's actually free. So um, yeah, so go, go check it out. I'll let you guys, I think, I think we're on to lunch now, so I don't want to keep you too long. But if you have any questions, please ask or come up. Uh, happy to answer. Thanks, guys.